This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Howard Luke. We're here at the Think Tech Studios. And after two years since our last broadcast of the Living Legend Lawyer series, uh, we're restarting. And I can't think of a better guest for this afternoon session than a man who is truly a living legend lawyer. He may be, he may be the oldest or most senior practicing, practicing lawyer in the state of Hawaii. His name is Vernon Tashima. I titled this myself and I called it the life and practice of a gentleman lawyer because in the years that I've known Mr. Tashima, uh, he has always struck me as the consummate gentleman uh, in court, out of court, by reputation, and by all my conversations with him. I would like to introduce you to uh, Mr. Vernon Tashima. He's seated to my immediate left, and um, we'll be interviewing him through the course of this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Tashima, I, I would like to first wish you a early happy birthday. I understand in well, about a little over a week, you will, may I say, the birthday that yeah. you'll be celebrating? Thank you. It may turn, next Thursday would be my birthday. Yeah, 98 years old. 98 years. 98 years young, I should say. <laughs> Very sharp. In fact, when I um, had a little trouble remembering exactly uh, where we were supposed to be, you told me. And so this is why we are here. Um, we have... A, few, a little less than half an hour to speak with you, so I would like to get right into it because you've lived such a wonderful, fruitful, and meaningful life for all the citizens of our state that I think we should start off with um, your background. Uh, you're originally from the island of Hawaii, is that correct? The big island, so to speak, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were born in Pahoa? Town, town called Pahoa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was that a plantation town at that time? Uh, yes, well, it's a plantation town. You, livelihood was uh, working in the cane fields. and You worked it. in the cane fields yourself? I did, yes. You know, when I last was here, I interviewed uh, Judge Alfred Loretta, who was the first uh, Filipino judge who uh, became a United States District Judge, mm -hmm. and also uh, the very, very... Uh, well-respected Simeon Akoba, retired associate judge mm -hmm. of the justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. They came from plantation backgrounds, but you actually worked on the plantation. Is that correct? Well, in a way, we were forced to work in the cane fields. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were born in 1920, is that right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about your background, your family, your parents, where they were from originally, and, and your brothers and sisters. Well, <clears throat> my parents came together from... Um, they called it a state in Japan, a prefecture we call it, a place called Kumamoto. Kumamoto. And it's in the southern islands of uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. and I believe they, were, uh, they came on a contract basis to work in the cane fields. And as I understand, they were here about 19... Oh, one thereabouts, and mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> settled in Pahoa. Right. So, <clears throat> numerous families came from Japan and elsewhere to oh, work yes. in the cane fields. Eh? Yeah, coincidentally, my mother's um, sister, my auntie, uh, moved to a uh, to town about ten miles away from Pahoa, a town at that time called Ola. Uh, it's still called Ola. Is, is that it, right? I think so. I, I thought yeah. they called it Kao. Oh, or, maybe maybe they do. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do. So, uh, and they both came directly from Kumamoto. Mm -hmm. How many people? What What would you say the population was of Pahoa at that time? I, you told me by families, right? How many families lived in Pahoa? Well, it's a rough guess. I would say. Um, 75 families, maybe. Okay. Mostly Japanese ancestry? Or? Uh, yes, I mean, the immigrant, immigrant laborers. They, on the side, they came on a contract uh, to work for three years and um, accumulate enough to get back to Japan. 
Oh, they were so, planning to return to Japan. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Did they ever return to Japan? No, but after three years, increase in family size, they extended their contract, so to speak, and finally considered themselves uh, Hawaii residents and stayed here. Right. What was life growing up, uh, being a young boy? What, what did you do for fun? Uh, well, what, um, you talking about recreation or livelihood or whatever? Yeah, whatever was legal, uh, recreation, yeah. Well, <clears throat> growing up in a plantation town, uh, that's all we can do, work for the plantation and um, in the cane fields. So that's kind of work and during the summertime that I would do. Later on, about the eighth and ninth grades, you know, there was a program called Future Farmers of America. And there were two years of so-called agricultural training. And we learned to, for whatever it's worth, identify plants, you know, trees, fruits, whatever. And part of the time was spent in the cane fields working. What that was, was your during job the school at year, in fact. What did, what did you do uh, as a worker in the cane fields? Oh, it's you know, all kinds of jobs like, <clears throat> say, weeding or you know, cutting, cutting the cane and loading it in cane trucks to set it to the mill to be processed into sugar. You know, uh, the various, I mean, various type of work involved in the cane fields, so planting the cane, and, um, well, you would actually plant, help plant the cane. Yeah. Well, we were, as part of the future farmers training, we had to do those things too. In summertime, we work uh, in the cane fields. Now, um, I know that some people don't like to be asked the question about you know how much money they get paid or, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Tell us about uh, if you would. How much, uh, how were you paid and how much did you make for this? As program? I recall, at that time it was about 25 cents an hour. Um, so <clears throat> that was a, more or less an eight hour work. Um, get up early in the morning and ride the so-called cane cars and you driven to the, the field to work on uh, and the types of work involved with harvesting, uh, cleaning the fields and whatever. So, but we take contracts to load the cane in the trucks, cane trucks, send it to the mill, and uh, a contract price is 40 cents a ton. When you load the cane truck in to the top, it was about four tons. So two of us would get together and we'd load That's say, a lot of cane, three yeah. cane trucks. 12 tons and for uh, 40 four dollars and 80 cents a day and we split it 240 uh, two yeah. two dollars and 40 and cents so for each of you we don't have to work till four o'clock as soon as the work is done you do for the day through for the day how did you feel about having all that money in your pocket oh well it was a lot of money at that time yeah yeah, yeah. but <clears throat> so yeah what are you going to do with all that money you know yeah <laughs> During school, I, I, you mentioned to me before that you, uh, you went to English school in the day and then Japanese school in the afternoon. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> at that time we called it the English school. Um, it was about, from about eight to two. That was on one side of the uh, playground, the, the baseball field, and on the other end of the uh, baseball field or the playground it was a Japanese language school. So we go to school, it's a so-called English school, finish about 2 o'clock, 2.30 mm -hmm. or 3, uh, off to the Japanese language school you know, for a couple of hours. Um, so and as you got older, the older you know, students were allowed to go to school, the Japanese language school, early in the morning before going to the so-called English school. 
So the afternoon was reserved for the young, for the young young children. fellows. Yeah. You know, this is, um, uh, I don't know if you can do this, but if, if you were to close your eyes and think back, can you see some of your classmates running around the playground and going to school? Can you still remember them? Oh, this oh, is in yes. the 1920s, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you have a long life, and we have a, we just started, and uh, we have a long way to go. So you moved from the elementary school, high school, uh, and you went to high school in Hilo, is that right? Correct. At Hilo High School. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get from Pahoa to Hilo? Well, Pahoa had only nine grades, so after the ninth grade, um, there was not enough in the town to create a high school. So we had to commute to Hilo High School by, by a bus. Um, and it was a yellow wooden wagon, we call it, nicknamed Banana Wagon. The Banana Wagon. You know, and yeah. the fellow running the uh, you know, so-called taxi was with about six, about six, about six passengers uh, to come to Hilo High School. So you went to Hilo High, eventually graduated, and um, you were accepted at the University of Hawaii. Is that correct? Yes. So w what I'd like to do is, I'm just going to let you uh, run with this, but you went to the University of Hawaii, and I understand uh, the war was uh, uh, sort of interrupted your education. You, know, you were planning to go to law school. Uh, you had a applied to law school and were accepted, am I correct? Well, <clears throat> during high school, of course, um, I give my parents credit, of course, they were all for education. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, there was a, the eldest in my family was a school teacher, and they wanted all of us below to get a, an education. So from Hilo, high school to go to college because I, I didn't know what I wanted to be at the time, but go to college. So after finishing high school in 37, 1937 that is, uh, <clears throat> I got accepted at the University of Hawaii and, uh, and I boarded in a private home while going to the university. And, where the uh, you know, what's I mean the Alamona Center is now there was a private home there that I boarded and went to the university. Wow. Well, very interesting. Uh, we're going to take a break right now, and then we'll come back after a few announcements, I believe. Okay. okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come banging on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You can talk to God, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Mr. Tashimo, uh, you went to the University of Hawaii and then everyone knows the war uh, started in December 7, 1941. Were you still in college or had you already graduated? Had you already graduated from university when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed? Um, yes, I... Uh, uh, I had a BA degree in early, early 1941, before the war started in December of that year. Uh, but I 
I was already accepted in law school at that time, but I was not able to because of family finances and they couldn't afford to send me to uh, law school. So, so I had to work. Um, and <clears throat> after a few years working, I was drafted into the uh, army in 1944. So about a year, a little more than a year before the end of the war, yeah. about two years left. Um, you stayed in Hawaii during the war at Schofield Barracks? Uh, in the army, yes. Uh, I was stationed at um, Schofield. You know. <clears throat> you know, so for two years I was here, uh, discharged in 1946. And then you went back to uh, then consider law I, school. <laughs> Check with the law school because it was five years or four years after I'd been accepted whether my credentials were still good and they said yes I'm you know right. it's still okay so uh, went to Washington University in St. Louis. Great school. You didn't uh, finish at Washington University. You you changed. You decided to transfer to the University of Kansas. Is that correct? Yes. I, it wasn't because you saw the Wizard of Oz or anything like that. It wasn't because you saw the Wizard of Oz in, in the movies. No, yeah. I, I didn't know about Wizard of Oz at that <laughs> time. But, um, it was more of a family matter. I was already married with a you know, daughter who was eight months old when I left for law school. And um, so I stayed at a dormitory at Washington University. And, I want to find housing if I can bring my family over. So, you know, wrote to the schools around, and Eros Kansas wrote back saying, "Yes, we have housing, but you have to be a married veteran to qualify." So a married veteran. I qualified which you were. on both counts, right. so transferred. I was given government housing, um, and, and I called my family up to join me. Great. I understand that, you know, your daughter moved, your very young daughter, she was probably the Asian, only Asian girl in the playground at the time, but she got along well with the fellow yeah. children. We right. were the only family, a different family, so to speak. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier to me uh, before the broadcast that about 99% of the class were, it was composed of veterans, is that correct? Yes. Including women. Women. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, Mr. Sashima, in the interest of time, I've got to, I have, really have to move forward. Coming back to Hawaii, now you're, uh, in, you already, you know, got, have your law degree, you took the bar examination, passed, uh, and now you're ready to hang out your shingles, is that right? That this would be about, what year was it, about 1950 or so? Yes, well, I got my, <clears throat> excuse me, I got my license in December of 1950. Okay, and, and how was it looking for a job in Hawaii? Very, <laughs> locally speaking, it's very tough. It's, it's not easy. Um, in a way, I was fortunate one day, I met my uh, old teacher from my grade school, and he was then a deputy superintendent of the Department of Education. And uh, <clears throat> he found out what I was not doing at the time, and he said, all right, um, we'll make you a substitute teacher. So I was called to you know, be a substitute at the, at the public schools here. You know, it wasn't a substitute teaching. It was more monitoring the class. And my, I remember my first assignment was at Parenting High School. And just sit in the class, call the roll, and keep the class quiet, you know. How did you become a lawyer? How did, how do you make the transition into, into the practice of law? How did I? How did you become a lawyer? I mean, how did you start your practice? Um, well, if I may digress and give a little background, um, I, in the ninth grade, for some reason, I was called by the principal to say, we want you to be the school prosecutor. I didn't okay. know what, what he meant by that. 
you know, so I said, well, what's a prosecutor? You Well, now you know because your son is a career prosecutor <laughs> and he might retire before you do. <laughs> yeah, at that Wayne, time, Wayne at that time, oh, if somebody, you know, a classmate steals a, a pencil from the uh, neighbor or a skate, so that you prosecute. Well, okay, you teach me. And that may have been in my mind because when I signed up at the University of Hawaii, I was signed up for Teachers College. Mm -hmm. That afternoon, for some reason, I went back to the university and changed my major into, at that time they called it social sciences, uh, pre the pre-law mm -hmm. uh, major or whatever. But there was no counselor in the school to tell you or educate you as to what type of courses you must take. So anyway, I just then started economics and all kinds of uh, you know, all, courses. All, all the great you know, pre-law classes. You know, got my BA yeah. degree and off to law school. Right. Um, when you were practicing law in the early years, um, there were, I, I guess, fewer minorities, uh, people of Asian descent, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, maybe a few Koreans. Um, did you find, did you come across anything that you perceived as discrimination in, in hiring? Well, me, it not, may not have been directed to me personally, but I guess being brought up in the plantation, I had that so-called plantation mentality and that um, I was inferior to the white people, so to speak. Because yeah. working in the plantation, he was the, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the lunas, the, yeah. we call it a luna, uh -huh. uh, come around riding a big horse with a whip. Yeah. He didn't actually whip us, but in the shore of, you know, Shore of authority, yes. You know, authority. Yeah. And that carried over to your so practicing law. I guess that carried over. Yeah. You know, yeah. Until I was put straight by one yeah. of the judges, in a way. I want to ask you about women and the law. When you were practicing, there were a handful of women practicing. Is that correct? There were some women also practicing law at the time. As Who I were recall, they? there were about three the strongest ladies at that time um, practicing. And I recall somebody mentioned that there were about 250 lawyers when I mm -hmm. first came back to practice. And there were veterans also before me. Um, so you know, with three women, that, that sounds like slightly over 1% were female. At that time, yes, with yeah. just a handful. And yeah. when, when we sat down to talk a bit before the show started, you mentioned that you have a, a great deal of respect for those uh, women who are practicing law and they're very good attorneys. They include, uh, you mentioned Harriet Boslog, and, and yes. who, who else was there? Well, the ladies conducted themselves professionally. They were uh, very, uh, well, not acting as if, hey, I'm a lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. I'm better than you or whoever. I see. But they were very um, professional about their own practice and their conduct with other lawyers. So I respected them. Really. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if we had sufficient time, I'd, I'd ask you about this, but I'm going to kind of fly over it. You were uh, one of the s first people and the only person at one time involved in the legal aspects of the development of condominium law. We don't have time to talk about that, but I just thought I'd uh, discuss that. Uh, at least set it out there for our viewers to note. Uh, today, you still practice law. You still go to court. You yeah. still go to court every week at least, right? Well, not every week, <laughs> but uh, I still do. I sure see you a lot in court. And uh, <laughs> So tell us about your practice today. What do you do? Today's practice? Well, I, um, when I was with the, uh, <clears throat> at that time they called it the city attorney's office, um, and 
for some reason, I was you know, put in charge of land acquisition. I worked for the city as a deputy attorney for about eight, nine years. And so as the person in charge of land acquisition, we had to do a lot of, uh, you know, well, condemnation work, taking land for roadways, school sites, and all that. And you know, I was, you know, I mentioned that um, I was offered the job by Mr. Henry Kaiser uh, to be house counsel for Hawaii Car Development. And that's where I learned more about you know, property work, real property work. And that's that's been the basis. That's your yeah. bread and butter property. Yeah. So property law. one of the first um, people that I met there after I had re left um, Kaiser Development said, "Say, hey, how about working on the, the uh, at that time they called it horizontal property regime." I didn't know first thing about that, but that was the forerun of the condominium, condominium law. law that we know. Because of uh, we because a short period of time we have left, I did want to touch on this. Um, I hope you don't mind my doing so, but I was very moved and impressed. You had a great marriage, um, your wife, and uh, you, you could remember how long you were married to the day. Uh, you spoke so lovingly about your wife. Um, could you share that with us? What makes a, you know what makes for a great marriage? <clears throat> well, my wife was from my hometown. And unfortunately, I lost her 11 years ago. Uh, and at that point, we were together uh, 62 years, 11 months, and 22 days, I believe. Right. And, and, and uh, folks, you know, Mr. Tashima has uh, it's a wonderful uh, chapter of his yeah. life. Uh, sorry to have it come to a close. And it's one of the reasons why he continues to work because uh, he finds that he doesn't get lonely at home. I, I don't know if I, you don't mind my mentioning that, but you're a professional. Well, I kind of do yeah. continue to work because there's nothing else to do instead of staying home and doing nothing. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Um, a great man. I see him as a gentleman attorney. He makes me feel young, even though I'm starting to get a bit up there in my years. And happy birthday to you, Mr. Tashima. <laughs> happy 98th birthday, and we look forward to seeing you in the future in court. Thank you very yeah. much for having me. Yeah, thanks so very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.